Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on the cold, cold, wet day. Too wet to go out and play. I know the Dr. Seuss fans in the audience really like that for a moment. Before I get started, though, there's something special about today. And that is today is the second anniversary of Valerie and me. So, honey, I love you. Thank you for being part of my life. You know, uh, recently, J.J. Wilson back here, he came up to me and thanked me. I just signed an extension to the contract. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Joe Shepard, the president of Western New Mexico University. And he said, thank you for signing the contract. And my answer to him is the same as to you. Thank you for being part of my life. Because if you were part of our life, if Valerie didn't like it here, if I didn't like it here, it, it doesn't matter how beautiful the place is, right? I'm sure there's some beautiful places in Syria, but I don't think I want to be there. And that's what it is about this place. This place is very special. We were talking to the Parodies a little bit ago. That's what makes a difference. That's the why of why we're here. And when we got married, of course, Valerie moved here. And I teased last night's audience that said that when she was in Athens, Greece, undercover as a CIA agent, she always wanted to live in Silver City. And tonight I tease her that she always wanted to marry a a guy named Joe, and she's done that a couple times. And I just really appreciate you, honey. Thank you for taking a chance on me and making our lives together. Neighbor, it's good to see you, as always. Uh, Ted is um, a member of the Hemingway Society. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, Graham Spanier, Dr. Spanier, President Emeritus of Penn State, always good to see you. Gave a great talk last night. And um, just uh, I, I've gotten a lot of wonderful comments from some of the same members of this, this group here. And, uh, of course, we didn't have many people come to see a magic show uh, uh, today, but uh, uh, Dr. Spanier does do that. But tonight I want to get us started in terms of what's really special. We have a, a distinguished lecture series and we've had some fantastic speakers. In fact, I will remind you that in 2018, that is, or 2016, that is when Valerie came and spoke on the same stage and we met for the first time. No, nothing happened at that time, it took us a couple years. But throughout the years, we've had these phenomenal speakers and to take advantage of that as a community really makes it something, someplace special to live. Tonight, we're also, if you will, the modern day of a simulcast. We have Zoom going on. I think there's about nine, 10 uh, students on Zoom right now. Hello to you and welcome to this as well. And of course, later on, when, if you happen to have a question, how we'll handle your questions is you have a chat feature. And in your chat feature, of course, you can ask a question. Michael Cust and his team, always a pleasure to have you working the, working the mics can, can assist us with that. So the format tonight is, uh, well, I'll introduce our guest here in just a second, but we're going to have a wonderful lecture. And then afterwards, we'll have an opportunity for, for questions uh, from, from the audience or comments that you might want to make. Let me move right on to, into our lecture. Tonight, it's a very special evening. Many of us know Hemingway from his, his, his plethora of writings and so forth. What many of us may not know is over the years he wrote over 6,000 letters to various people, some handwritten, some typed, and so forth. Well, along the way was Dr. Sandy Spanier. And Dr. Spanier dedicated really her life to understanding, studying about all things Hemingway. And in that process became the most respected scholar in the world when it comes to Hemingway. No matter whether it's the foundation, the family, or whomever it might be, Dr. Spanier is who they turn to when they, they, they want to understand a little bit more about, about his legacy. She has written over 13 books, not all on Hemingway. However, most recently, she's been entrusted with his letters and is up to volume six out of 17 volumes. She has a ways to go. Fortunately, she's only 32 years old. And it is, is, is indeed a great privilege to have for us tonight to give us the insights to all things Hemingway, Dr. Sandy Spanier. Thanks for that very generous introduction. Uh, is the sound okay? Can you all hear me? Higher? Okay, how about, is this better? Okay. Um, all right. Hemingway claimed to have rewritten the ending of his novel, A Farewell to Arms, 39 times before he was satisfied. 
He told that to George Plimpton in 1958. People assumed he exaggerated, but the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston has 47 different endings in its archive of Hemingway papers. In contrast to the painstaking craftsmanship of his fiction, his letter writing style was spontaneous and informal. The English writer Ford Maddox Ford advised him that a man should always write a letter thinking of how it would read to posterity. Hemingway scorned that advice, saying, this made such a bad impression on me that I burned every letter in the flat, including Ford's. In Hemingway's view, letters should be written not for posterity, but for the day and the hour, and posterity will always look after herself. A roster of Hemingway's correspondence reads like a 20th century who's who. Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, John Dos Passos, Archibald MacLeish, Gary Cooper, Ingrid Bergman, and Marlena Dietrich, to name just a few of the most famous ones. He also corresponded copiously with his family, his parents, grandparents, five siblings, four wives, three sons, and with friends across the continents. He also responded generously to queries from scholars, students, and strangers. The surviving letters we've located to date are directed to 1,900 different recipients. He once described his letters as often libelous, always indiscreet, often obscene, and many of them could make great trouble. He never wanted his letters to be published, and he specified that in a 1958 directive to the executors of his estate. Following his death in 1961, two decades passed before his widow authorized the publication of a volume of selected letters, 581 of them, edited by Princeton professor Carlos Baker and published by Scribner's in 1981. Well, in 2002, I was very honored to be named general editor of the Hemingway Letters Project and put in charge of this effort to gather and publish a scholarly edition of the author's letters, which is being published by Cambridge University Press. At first, we expected this would run about a dozen volumes. And since then, we've had to revise that to an estimated 17 volumes to hold the some 6,000 surviving letters about 85% of them never before published. The first volume of the letters of Ernest Hemingway spanned 1907 to 1922, and it appeared in 2011. Volume five, spanning 1932 through May 1934, was published in June of 2020. We're completing work on volume six, uh, slated for publication in fall 2023. Volume six spans June 1934 through June 1936, and for the first time ever, we're going to include an appendix of earlier letters that have surfaced since we published the volumes in which they would have belonged chronologically. Patrick Hemingway here uh, is Hemingway's sole surviving son of the three. He was the middle son. Um, he's now 94 years old. He's been particularly supportive of this project, meeting with me on a number of occasions, including here at his home in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, we have sort of a routine. I bring a fat stack of letters marked with little sticky flags, and he answers questions, offers insights, and recounts anecdotes about his father that only he is alive to tell. Patrick specifically wants this to be a complete collection of his father's letters with no picking and choosing, as he puts it, not a selected edition. As he put it, I think the real interest from writers' letters is all of them. Let the cards fall where they may. People can make up their own minds. The Hemingway Letters Project is unusual for its reach and appeal to a wide audience outside of academe. Since it began, it has been the subject of about 400 media articles and book reviews, more than 50 radio and television pieces, interviews, and podcasts. And before publication of volume one, uh, the October 2011 issue of Vanity Fair had Angelina Jolie on the cover and then a, a selection of newly published letters from the, the volume one of, of uh, the letters of Ernest Hemingway. So this is very unusual uh, attention being attracted by an academic project. 
Uh, but the, I've just learned not to underestimate the public's interest in Hemingway. Uh, just since we published our first volume in 2011, there have been more than 160 nonfiction books, uh, 17 works of Hemingway-based fiction, including the best-selling book, The Paris Wife by Paula McLean, um, and several new editions of his work have been published in at least 18 languages, including Chinese, Arabic, Hebrew, and Slovenian. For the past several years, I served as an advisor to the three-part, six-hour documentary film project on Hemingway directed by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, which premiered on PBS in 2021 and has generated yet more public interest in Hemingway's life and work. The first, at the outset of the project, the first challenge was to find the letters because they're not all in one place. Hemingway did not routinely keep copies, and so we had to do a lot of detective work, and we also had to hope that people kept their mail. Not everybody did. To date, we've gathered copies of letters from some 250 sources in the United States and abroad, including more than 70 libraries and institutions and more than 180 dealers and private collectors, some of whom corresponded with Hemingway themselves. The John F. Kennedy Library in Boston has donated copies of the entire holdings of about 2,500 outgoing Hemingway letters, and we got copies of about 1,500 more letters from Princeton, which holds the archives of Charles Scribner's sons, Hemingway's publisher, and also his son Patrick. In 2008, my home institution, Penn State University, uh, acquired a large and important private collection of more than 100 family letters from the author's nephew, um, whose name, after his uncle, is Ernest Hemingway Mainland of Petoskey, Michigan. And he was the son of Hemingway's sister, Madeline, whose nickname was Sonny. And here, uh, Grace Hemingway is lining up all six kids for a picture in front of the family cottage, Windermere, on Walloon Lake in, in Michigan. And Sonny is the third from the front. And uh, flash forward many decades, and here the same crooked tree is still there. And this is uh, Sonny's son, Ernie, and me a few years ago in front of that same tree at Windermere. Uh, Ernie Mainland became a great friend of the project, and in the course of cleaning out his attic in his garage, he sin had since donated more family treasures, including five volumes of scrapbooks that Grace Hemingway compiled for her daughter, Sunny, as she did for each of her six children, and as a mother, I'm very impressed by that. Um, these scrapbooks for each of the children contain photographs, her notes on the family's activities, and uh, there was even a previously unidentified Hemingway letter uh, that even Ernie didn't know what it was. It was a 1915 postcard to his sister that was signed for Butch, but we, I recognize the, ha the handwriting as Hemingway's. These scrapbooks are just wonderfully full of family details, and here on the bottom, there's a, the, the bottom photograph there, uh, was taken on May 30th, 1916, and it's captioned, All But Daddy Who Took the Picture. This is a 1914 letter to his mother in his dad's letterhead envelope. His father was a doctor, Dr. Clarence uh, Hemingway, and it's marked urgent, I-R-G-E-N-T, I-R-G-U-N-T. Um, Hemingway's letters are very famous, and, uh, uh, sorry, he, he was famous at such an early age that his letters and books became collector's items as early as 1930, and the market continues for them. In 2007, a single 1925 letter to Ezra Pound sold at Christie's Auction House in London for 78,000 pounds sterling, which at the time was equivalent to more than $157,000 for one letter. Um, this is a pretty charming letter uh, that was sold at Sotheby's in 2004. It was written in May 1912, and uh, it reads, I f Dear Daddy, I feel a lot better when all my work is done and my conscience is clear. And he has these circles at the bottom, uh, lovingly Ernie, uh, circles with dots in the middle, and that's like a family thing. They're called twosies. And uh, Patrick Hemingway, when I showed him this letter, 
was astonished because he didn't, he, his father, Ernest Hemingway, would use those symbols for kisses in letters to him, Patrick. Patrick didn't realize that Ernest Hemingway was carrying on a tradition that his own father had used with him. Um, we've researched dealer listings, auction records um, of all of the thousands of Hemingway letters that have sold over the decades, and we hope that uh, we can track down the purchasers and that then they'll be willing to share copies with the project. Also, because of attention to the project, dozens of people from around the world have contacted us. Uh, we heard from the widower of Hemingway's part-time secretary in the late 1940s and early 1950s, a woman who was otherwise employed by the U.S. Embassy in Havana, who shared trans copies of her transcriptions of 120 letters that Hemingway had dictated into a wire recorder. A man in Connecticut sent copies of three Hemingway letters, um, he letters Hemingway wrote to him in the early 1950s in response to a critique he'd written for his college newspaper on Hemingway's latest book, The Old Man and the Sea. And he had the nerve to mail that uh, review from his student newspaper to this great author, Ernest Hemingway, in Cuba. Uh, he recalled that he was astonished that the great writer would take the time to respond to a 21-year-old college student who had the temerity to critique his work. And he saw that as evidence that Hemingway was an understanding and caring person. A, a woman in Idaho whose father ran the Hertz Rent-A-Car franchise in Boise discovered in his old briefcase a 1959 letter from Hemingway apologizing for a mix-up in payment of his bill. So we hear from people all over the world, um, and it keeps going. So uh, what do we do with the letters once we have them? Uh, this is an example of a of a letter that came to Penn State from the, the nephew, Ernest Hemingway Mainland. And I should also stress that for our work, we gather only copies of letters, not the originals, which of course are very valuable. Um, each of these letters uh, gets an accession number, and that's that number, there's a PSU 090.7, that means it's the seventh page of that particular letter. We log them into a master archive, and we do include envelopes when we have them. They can be very uh, valuable for the postmark information. Uh, we transcribe them. Uh, at the outset of the project, the technical people were just sure that there'd be a possible way to scan these with optical character recognition and turn them into typing, and it just was not possible. So um, there are many decisions that have to be made also when you're transcribing a letter, and we have an advisory committee that spent many, many hours hashing through what are we going to do if Hemingway left out a period at the end of a sentence? Are we going to reproduce his spelling errors? And we have a very fat editorial manual with all these policies that we've, we continue to refine as we continue with the work. We also have to determine what references are going to need to be annotated or explained to uh, current readers. So titles of literary works, current events, like the 1932 presidential election, uh, the names of French boxers, the names of bullfighters, and we also have to keep our international audience in mind. Um, in an early letter written in high school, Hemingway had a bad head cold, and he wrote to a, a friend in his class, my nose was running like old faithful. So our publishers in England, and of course, old faithful is the geyser in Yellowstone National Park that erupts uh, every so often, and so I asked her if Old Faithful was going to need to be explained, and she said to me, what's that, a dog? So, uh, yes, we needed to annotate Old Faithful as the Yellowstone geyser. Um, we also look at incoming letters, letters he received for context and information about the letters he wrote. Now, this is a really interesting letter because it has some pretty bombshell information um, Hemingway had received a letter from his sister, Sonny, saying that she was coming to Europe to visit. And this caught him off guard because he now has to tell her that he is leaving his first wife, Hadley, and marrying his second wife, Pauline, which he has not told the family yet. So in this letter to uh, his sister, he writes, this is private and confidential. 
No one knows it but you, and it's not to be repeated to anyone, surtout la famille. I expect to marry Pauline Pfeiffer, who is a swell girl, and that's not just my own biased opinion, either in May or June. So this is what the raw material looks like. This, I don't expect you to be able to read it, is what it looks like on the printed page. So we have the text of the letter, and then with numbered footnotes, and at the end of each letter, we have number one, Hemingway is responding to his sister Sonny's letter of 26 February 1926, in which she'd asked if she could come visit him in Paris that summer. And uh, footnote number two, he, he used the French expression, surtout la famille, and so we write especially the family uh, French. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is to give you a brief biographical overview of Hemingway because I know not everybody is, is thoroughly steeped in his life and work and uh, then I'll talk about the latest volume of his letters. Um, he was born in Oak Park, Illinois, a uh, western suburb of Chicago, July 21st, 1899. And like many places where he lived, there is a plaque outside of this house. Uh, his when his grandparents died, his mother came into some money and she designed this house at 600 North Kenilworth Street. And it was about two blocks across the playground of his school from the Oak Park office of Frank Lloyd Wright. And this uh, prairie modernism people have talked about if there might have been some type of influence from, oh, from architecture over to writing in, in his work. Uh, this is the Hemingway family at that time. Uh, he had a, a number of sisters. Uh, this was his, his uh, family home again. Uh, my husband and I had a very rare experience of uh, being actually sleeping in Hemingway's bedroom one time. I was invited uh, in 2014 to give a, a talk at the annual Oak Park, Illinois Hemingway Festival. And one of the people on the Hemingway Foundation board there happened to own the Hemingway house and invited us to, to stay. So it was truly thrilling to be in this room, to look at the cracks in the ceiling and know that those probably were the same cracks Ernest Hemingway looked at, and then to look at his window and for all the things that have changed in Oak Park and other places, that view was, was probably about the same. Uh, another place from the, the time he was really, right after he was born, until the time he went to, off to the First World War, the family would spend their summers at this cottage on Walloon Lake, Michigan, called Windermere. And Ernie Mainland, uh, the nephew, owns Windermere. And again, we were, had the extraordinary experience of being invited to stay there a few times. Um, and notice the strips of paper alongside the doorway. Um, when you look up close, all the Hemingway children, this was a mark of their height. So you have uh, five, 11 and a half, Ernest, 17 years, 1916. So um, Ernie sadly passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, the house is very much a living house uh, used by the family, but they have really respected the history of it. Um, for all the things that we include, uh, we define letters very broadly to include postcards, cables, and in this case, this is a note he passed to a friend in school. And they were planning a camping trip over spring break, and Hemingway's saying, we'll be as warm as we want to, it is like this. And then he draws this little diagram of the proper way to build a fire. It reflects the heat right into the mouth of the tent, he says. Um, and it's written on a, a piece of a calendar. Uh, this was included in, in the first volume of, of the letters, which I said came out in 2011. And he's looking very handsome there in his uh, Red Cross uniform. And in World War I, after he graduated from Oak Park High School, he did not go to college as his family uh, would have expected. He went off to work at the Kansas City Star as a cub reporter and then his eyesight wasn't good enough for him to, be, to join the military, but he became a volunteer Red Cross ambulance driver in Italy. This is a wonderful postcard that came in that collection from the nephew. Uh, it is uh, significant because we, it, it pinpoints the date when Hemingway actually went to the front. So it's postmarked from Milan on July or June 9th, 1918. Dear Dad, everything lovely. We go to the front tomorrow. 
I'm in the mountains, Ted and I were split up, been treated like kings, been two days here. Well, right after this, he gets um, transferred. At his, he thought it was too quiet there, so he wanted to go someplace where there was more action. So he volunteered for canteen duty on the Piave Riverfront, um, the front between the, the Austrians and the Italians in this town of Fosalta di Piave. And less than uh, three weeks after he wrote that letter, at this spot on the Piave River, he was severely wounded by a trench mortar, an Austrian trench mortar. Um, there is, as again, you can follow Hemingway markers all around the world that on this site um, uh, in 1918, Hemingway was wounded. Here he is in the American Red Cross Hospital in Milan, whistling very bravely, putting up a brave front for his family. Uh, he uh, wrote them uh, in a letter, uh, drew this little cartoon of himself, uh, give me a drink, and then he has 227 wounds marked on his legs there. This is his 19th birthday that he wrote this letter. Um, he wasn't too happy that the letters that he sent home, his proud parents then sent to the local newspaper, and the paper published his, his personal letters too. So there you have Hemingway in the hospital. He is shown whistling as in his childhood days he would whistle instead of cry when hurt, the caption says here. Uh, this, is, this was sent to me um, by someone in Italy, just out of the blue, um, who had taken a picture of the building where the American Red Cross Hospital was located at the time, and then there's a plaque on the outside. But you can see up around the top, there's a sort of a terrace. And um, this uh, is Agnes von Karowski, a Red Cross nurse who is about seven, eight years older than Hemingway. And during his convalescence there, they fell in love. And his idea was that he would go back to the United States and earn enough money that he could come back to Italy and they would get married. And here he is back in Oak Park, Illinois, in his, uh, his outfit, his military outfit, and he was going around uh, giving talks. Here is the trapeze, the local high school newspaper, and I love the way that Oak Park wins track honors is the headline, and only below it is Hemingway speaks to the high school. Um, so I love this kind of the, the mundane and the sublime mixture here. Well, Agnes von Krauske, that didn't work out. She met an Italian aristocrat whose family thought uh, she was a very common American, and uh, sadly, the aristocrat made Agnes burn all the letters from her old boyfriend, Ernest Hemingway, so those letters are just gone. Anyway, this is Hadley, uh, Elizabeth Hadley Richardson from St. Louis, also about seven years older than Hemingway, but they married in Horton Bay, Michigan in September of 1921. Um, Sherwood Anderson, the r American writer, Hemingway got to know in Chicago after the war, had told him, you don't want to go to Italy. What was Hemingway's goal was to get back to Italy after the war. He said, if, if you're going to be a writer, all the th everything's happening in Paris. You need to go to Paris. And so Hemingway and his wife Hadley in December of 1921 took off for Paris. Um, here he is uh, in a, like the legendary bookstore, Shakespeare and Company, as photographed by Sylvia Beach, the, the owner of it. Uh, they lived uh, in a very poor working class neighborhood uh, in the 5th arrondissement uh, near the Place de la Contrescarpe. The, this uh, apartment building now has a plaque that he, he lived there during the 20s. Um, not for very long, actually. That was their first residence. Um, this is a photograph that survives at the Kennedy Library that he actually took out of his window of that apartment. And again, it's very fun to follow Hemingway's footsteps around the world because uh, this is the same scene today and the buildings are still there. The graffiti is a little different, but um, he really did capture places. Uh, across the Luxembourg Gardens, he would walk and he would go over to the Salon of Gertrude Stein. Uh, this is Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, and she was sort of the guru of the young writers and they would literally sit at her feet the young men, Alice B. Toklas, would take the women out into another room and discuss recipes with them. Um, Hadley didn't appreciate that. But this is a letter I love because it is so fresh, his um, feeling about Paris. It's Valentine's Day, 1922. They've only been there 
couple of months, and he's writing to his mother, we know a good batch of people now in Paris, and if we allowed, it would have, ta have all our time taken up socially, but I'm working very hard and we keep plenty of time to ourselves. It is fun living in this oldest quarter of Paris, and we have a wonderful time. Paris is so very beautiful that it satisfies something in you that is always hungry in America. He continues, Gertrude Stein, who wrote Three Lives and a number of other good things, was here to dinner last night and stayed till midnight. She's about 55, I guess, and very large and nice. She is very keen about my poetry. And then he talks about how his typewriter is being repaired because it got knocked off by the person cleaning the, the apartment. And then he, the next day, he actually gets his typewriter back and continues the letter. Um, here he's saying, same letter, Friday we're going to T at Ezra Pounds. Um, and then I love this apology, which he didn't need to make. I'm sorry to write such dull letters, but I get such full expression in my articles and the other work I'm doing that I'm quite pumped out and exhausted from a writing standpoint. So my letters are very commonplace. If I wrote nothing but letters, all of that would go into them. Gertrude Stein went on to become the godmother of uh, Hadley's and Ernest's first son, Bumby, Jack Bumby. Um, they went up into the mountains uh, of Switzerland. He was assigned, uh, he was working for the Toronto Star as a foreign correspondent to make a living to finance their trip to Europe. And they spent time near Chambly. Uh, he discovered bobsledding and he would write these articles uh, back to the Toronto Star. He's actually the last one on the sled. You can see him in a hat there and his mustache. Um, this is a photograph of, of Ernest and Hadley and they were just so in love and he writes back to a, a friend of his, it's so beautiful here that it hurts in a numb sort of way all the time. Only when you're with somebody your lover's with, the beauty gets to be just sort of a tremendous happiness. It's so damn beautiful and we have so much fun. Um, so there are Hadley, Ernest, and their son, Bumby, um, and this paradise didn't last forever. Uh, this is a, um, a photograph taken in Pamplona, uh, and the woman in the middle is Pauline Pfeiffer, who is a good friend of Hadley's, who's sitting on the other side of Ernest Hemingway in the beret. And, um, you know, very long, complicated story short, Hemingway fell in love with them both and went through this torment, but it was ultimately... Uh, and, and this kind of torment uh, is a subject of The Sun Also Rises, his 1926 novel, which takes place in Paris and Pamplona. Um, ha Hadley did finally consent to a divorce, and uh, Ernest and Pauline married in, in Paris in 1927. Uh, they decided uh, she was pregnant, and they wanted to have the baby in America, so they went to Key West. It was a way to get back to her home in Piggott, Arkansas, um, the way the ship came to Havana and then Key West. They ended up settling there, not right away, but um, as some of you who have visited Key West know, this is the Ernest Hemingway house. They actually bought it in um, 1931 with money from Pauline's wealthy uncle Gus. Um, and this was the first pool in Key West, supposedly, and he did his writing in the upper uh, story of this pool house. So here's where he wrote A Farewell to Arms and many other things. Um, celebrity <laughs> followed them, and here's an example of uh, Good Housekeeping, October 1933. Now uh, Johnson's Wax wants Pauline Hemingway to endorse the product as a a series of famous writers' uh, homes. This really irked Hemingway. This is the bird's eye map for tourists of Key West. Um, during the Depression, when all the industry was destroyed, um, the sponging industry was gone, the cigar industry was gone, uh, the um, Roosevelt administration under the New Deal decided that the only way to revive Key West was through tourism. Hemingway really didn't like this idea much, and when his house ended up being number 18 on the tourist map and people started sort of rubbernecking past the house, um, he was not happy. Uh, Sloppy Joe's Bar is still there. Um, something momentous happened in uh, December of 1936. In walks this woman, Martha Gellhorn, who was a very accomplished writer and journalist herself, and sort of the rest was history. Um, the two of them, Martha Gellhorn and Ernest Hemingway, did the Spanish Civil War together, 
and when the cause was lost, Franco uh, was victorious and stayed in power until 1975. Uh, Ernest did not go back to Key West with his wife and, and sons. He went to Havana and started a life there. The Ambos Mundos Hotel, the pink building, is where it was his headquarters. Uh, the top, uh, there is a, a plaque here saying that in the decades of the 30s, Ernest Hemingway lived and wrote there. Wonderful view out of that room, which is today a, a museum, uh, room 511. Uh, Martha Gellhorn was a writer, and she just couldn't tolerate uh, the idea that two of them would be in this tiny little room uh, writing. So she went out and found in a classified ad this uh, estate outside of Havana, Finca Vigia, and this is what it looked like then, overgrown. This is what it looks like now. Um, and this is where Hemingway spent, he lived the longest uh, from 1939 until 1960 at Finca Vigia. It's now a national museum. Uh, these are photographs that they took on the property. Um, this is what the living room looks like now. Everything's been very carefully preserved, and I've also been involved in a, pro in a project of the Finca Vigia Foundation to preserve Hemingway's home and documents in Cuba. In other seasons, uh, they liked to go hunting in Idaho, and there was the newly built Sun Valley Lodge, which Averill Harriman built as war was brewing in Europe and invited Hemingway to come stay to add glamour and luster to this new resort. So he went there with Martha Gellhorn, um, posed for lots of pictures. Martha was continuing to write and being very successful at it. Uh, they, they got married. Uh, they, Pauline gave him a divorce finally, and they got married right after the publication of For Whom the Bell Tolls in 1940. Uh, their honeymoon was a trip to the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, Hemingway was rather reluctant. Uh, here Martha is off in the Caribbean. You can see her in the lower right, uh, the only woman there in, amidst all of these uh, fighting men. She was really irritated with Hemingway because she thought he should come to Europe and be a war correspondent. He's the most famous writer in the world. He could do some real good there. Um, she goaded him and goaded him. And finally, he said, okay, I will come. He went to Collier's Magazine, which was her magazine since 1937, and said, I would like to be your frontline correspondent. So of course, uh, she got bumped out of her job and he became the frontline correspondent for Collier's. Uh, on D-Day, she hid aboard a hospital ship and uh, actually went ashore with the stretcher bearers while Hemingway was with the official press corps. He got the cover page of Collier's Magazine and they, she filed a report. I've actually seen the, the documents in the archives. She filed her report earlier, but Collier's held it for three weeks before publishing it sort of in the back of the magazine. And here's Hemingway, the, the hero at that point. Um, this is Mar Mary Welsh Hemingway, whom uh, Hemingway met in London. She was a reporter for Time Life, and she was the last Mrs. Hemingway. Here they are aboard his beloved boat, the Pilar. Um, in the 50s, 1954, he got the Nobel Prize uh, for The Old Man in the Sea. It was awarded to him in Cuba. He was not well enough to make the trip to Sweden to accept it. Um, in 1953-54, he and Mary had gone on safari in Africa and had been involved in two plane crashes in two days. And the second plane crash, the rescue plane, when it crashed, um, he had to headbutt his way out of the plane. And he's right here, he's holding up the hand showing the severe burns on it. People who knew him said he was never the same after that. Um, in 1959, he and Mary bought this house in, Ketchum, Idaho, is sort of a hedge against what was going to happen in Cuba. They did not leave Cuba immediately after the Cuban Revolution, but uh, they were sort of they got a visit from the American ambassador finally, telling them that it was going to be seen as disloyal if they didn't leave. Um, they ended up uh, spending their last months, unhappy months, in this. Uh, Hemingway was being uh, uh, hospitalized in the Mayo Clinic and treated for severe depression and and other psychological problems, although they didn't want anyone to know that. Um, in, on June 2nd, 1961, um, he killed himself here in the living room of his home. 
He's buried in uh, the cemetery in Ketchum, Idaho, and people will come and, and bring offerings to his grave. So that is a fast forward <laughs> life of Ernest Hemingway. And I want to tell you a bit now about the letters of the most recent volume, volume five. This is a period, um, it spans 19, uh, January 1932 through May of 34. And with the critical and commercial success of A Farewell to Arms, Hemingway had achieved international renown and he had entered his prime. So during this period, he completed and published his monumental bullfighting book, Death in the Afternoon, and a short story book, Winner Take Nothing, which includes such famous short stories as A Clean, Well-Lighted Place and fathers and sons. When he was not actively writing, he was most often fishing or hunting. Uh, in the 29-month span of the volume, he spent only nine months at home in Key West. So he crisscrossed the United States from his home in Key West to Pigott, Arkansas, where his wife's parents lived, to Wyoming and Montana for big game hunting. And here he is at the El Bar T Ranch in a rare horseback pose. And Pauline is sitting in a chair in the background reading. Um, he pursued his new pound passion for big game fishing in the Gulf Stream off the coast of Cuba. In late 1933, he embarked on a long anticipated African safari. And he also began writing for this brand new men's magazine, Esquire. And from the very first issue, published in autumn of 1933, he was Esquire's leading contributor. His name was literally at the top of the list of contributors on the cover. Upon returning from Africa in April of 1934, he purchased his beloved boat, the Pilar, uh, with the help of an advance from the editors of Esquire. And this boat is now enshrined on the former tennis court at Finca Vigia in Cuba. And, but through all this, uh, he is still a prolific correspondent, and this particular volume includes 393 letters directed to 100 recipients. Now, the March uh, 1934 Vanity Fair featured this full-page Ernest Hemingway paper doll, captioned Ernest Hemingway, America's own literary caveman, hard-drinking, hard-fighting, hard-loving, all for art's sake. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Heavy handed there. Okay, so the mustache central figure of Hemingway in a leopard skin loincloth holding a club in one hand and a dead rabbit in the other is captioned Ernie the Neanderthal Man. And he is flanked by four costumes that capture various personae. This slide is captioned Ernie as the unknown soldier. He's wearing a World War I uniform with a Red Cross armband and a blood-stained leg and leaning on a crutch. By the way, that blood-stained uniform is in the Key West Art and Historical Society in a glass case. You can go see in the bullet holes or in the wool uniform. It's family never threw anything away. Um, again, lucky for us scholars. Um, this slide is captioned Ernie as the lost generation, writing at a cafe table crowded with bottles. Um, here we have Ernie as Isaac Walton, the great uh, author of the Complete Angler Guide to Fishing. He's seated atop a pile of swordfish on a boat called the Anita. Um, here we have Don Jose, the Toreador, standing in a matador's costume, holding a bull by the horn. Um, this appearance I find very interesting because it marks his stature in popular culture and his place at the hub of the historical and cultural happenings of his time. Um, this particular issue of Vanity Fair, the lead article is Roosevelt's Revolution by Charm, which was an assessment of the first year of Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidency. And on the facing page, we have James Joyce, Genius Becomes Legal, we're reporting the recent lifting of the U.S. ban on Joyce's 1922 novel, Ulysses. And it's captioned, Portrait of the Artist as a bestseller. Um, this is pretty astonishing. Uh, as just magazine art, here is a painting by Pablo Picasso. And I have to tell you that in a couple of university libraries, sadly, this page has been sliced out, including at Penn State. So I had to get this uh, off the web. But that's what it did look like. 
Um, here's a portrait of FDR by the famous photographer um, Edward Steichen. Sinclair Lewis, who won first American to win the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature in 1930, is featured here with his wife, Dorothy Thompson, who was a famous journalist. Um, Marlena Dietrich, the Teuton siren, the German-born singer and film star. Well, Hemingway knew uh, Joyce Picasso and Sinclair Lewis. And later in the 30s, he met Marlena Dietrich aboard uh, a transatlantic liner, and photographers snapped them together when they disembarked. And it was the beginning of a lifelong friendship that apparently remained platonic for the entire time, but they carried on a correspondence. Um, when the ship came back uh, from their African safari in April of 1934, uh, there's a, the news photographers were there, and there is uh, Ernest and Pauline. Um, and at the same time, oops, sorry about that. Same time, uh, this, the next day, we have an article featuring uh, another famous person on the ship, Catherine Hepburn, um, another young celebrity, and with an interview with Hemingway in the stateroom. So here's the full... Uh, paper doll scenario again. Um, years after their marriage ended, his first wife, Hadley, said of him, Ernest was so complicated, so many sides to him, you could hardly make a sketch of him in a geometry book. And taken together, his letters reveal all these different sides that have too often been obscured by this mythical, macho, one-dimensional sort of cartoon character of Ernest Hemingway. Um, so let me just, I'll touch on some of these facets uh, as they're revealed in the letters. Uh, Ernie, the unknown soldier. Uh, one of the dramas that played out during this period was he had a big feud with Paramount Pictures over the 1932 film adaptation of A Farewell to Arms because Paramount P Pictures thought that a tragic ending was not going to be appealing to the American public, so they filmed a happy ending. And uh, Hemingway was quite outraged by that. Um, when he was visiting his in-laws in Arkansas, um, uh, Paramount tried to rope him into some publicity stunt by bringing a premiere showing of this movie to Piggott, Arkansas, before it premiered on Broadway so that they could get some advanced publicity. And they had uh, cabled him two prints unexpectedly available, make possible private showing for you and your family. And Hemingway wrote back, use your imagination as to where Paramount can put two prints unexpectedly available, etc. Um, although Paramount bought picture rights and the chance to make a great picture, they did not buy the right to make me look at a silly one, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Here we have Ernest uh, as Don Juan, or Don Jose, the Toreador. Um, Death in the Afternoon was the culmination of his long-held ambition to write a definitive nonfiction book on bullfighting, which was lavishly illustrated. Um, he had a big debate with his editor, Max Perkins, as to how many pictures the book could include while still selling for $3.50, because it's the Depression and people were very, very sensitive about prices. Uh, Perkins suggested a dozen photos, and Hem they settled on 81. Hemingway wanted more than 100. Um, this was a famous or infamous review by the leftist critic Max Eastman uh, uh, called Bull in the Afternoon, uh, charging Hemingway with wearing false hair on his chest. So predictably, Hemingway was outraged, um, and you can see these are his markings on the article that uh, survives at the Kennedy Library. Uh, in a letter to an, letters to many recipients, he vowed to break Mac, Max Eastman's jaw if he ever encountered him in person. And in 1937, the two would meet by chance in the office of their editor, Max Perkins, in New York, with Hemingway ripping open his shirt to show the uh, chest hair and ripping open Max Eastman's shirt to compare it and smacking Eastman in the face with a book and Max Perkins breaking up the fight. Um, okay, so Ernie is the lost generation. Uh, he maintained many of the literary friendships that he had forged in Paris in the 20s. Um, he invited his fellow writers, Archibald MacLeish, John Dos Passos, to come fishing in Key West. 
He lamented the troubles of F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he stayed in touch with Ezra Pound. Um, Ford Maddox Ford asked him to write a testimonial to Ezra Pound to coincide with the publication of a book of Pound's cantos, and Hemingway obliged by writing this, any poet born in this century or the last 10 years of the preceding century who can honestly say he has not been influenced by or learned greatly from the work of Ezra Pound deserves to be pitied rather than reproved. And aside from the content of this, the letter's a real-time record of Hemingway's struggle to compose this requested endorsement. Um, here is his attempt to type this out. Uh, here goes, any poet who or can, oh bugger this typewriter, and then he says here it is, and he goes on to, to write that um, little testimonial. So for the frontispiece of each volume, we like to try to feature a letter that's both interesting in its content, but also interesting visually, and we chose this one for volume five. Um, at the same time in this period, uh, Gertrude Stein comes out with the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, um, which is pretty savage to Hemingway. Uh, she had been his early mentor, the godmother of his son, and uh, yet she described Hemingway in this book as physically frail and accident prone, and she claimed to credit for teaching him how to write. So Hemingway was, again, very incensed and uh, wrote to a bunch of friends about this, but to Arnold Gingrich, the uh, editor of, of Esquire, he wrote, well, I liked Stein very much, was always damn nice to her and loyal as hell till kicked out on my backside. Am learning to be careful about liking people, being damn nice to same and especially being loyal. What the hell though, it's not worth it, but it gives you a jolt to have someone lie so much and with such malice. And you, it, it, with all the bravado, you can just hear how hurt he was that she sort of turned on him. Um, and now we come to, uh, Ernie as Isaac Walton, the great fisherman. Um, a new story was found uh, recently and published in The New Yorker in uh, 2020. And in this story, Hemingway relates uh, a tale of a marlin fishing adventure in a chartered boat, uh, a four-hour fight with an enormous fish that finally gets away when the first mate uh, cuts the wrong line and the fish swims away. So when I read this, I thought, that sounds really familiar, and I went back to the letters, and sure enough, this happened uh, just about like that in July 7th of 1933, and he writes this very, very uh, scenario that he later turned into fiction. Um, so the letters allow us to compare Hemingway's fictional accounts with his sort of breathless, blow-by-blow, real-life accounts of things as they are happening. And this is also, whether it's in this story or in something like The Old Man in the Sea. Um, this letter was written on July 7th of 1933, and he, the next day, um, that afternoon actually, happily caught a record black marlin 12 feet 8 inches long, um, the biggest catch of the season, and it was featured in uh, this uh, Marlin Off the Morrow, this spread for Esquire magazine. And that brings us back to the central figure of Ernie the Neanderthal Man. Um, in late September 1932, uh, he was hunting in the rugged mountains of northwest Wyoming, and the, the hunting camp was a 45-mile horseback ride from uh, the El Bar T Ranch where he was staying. And uh, so he wrote this to his art editor, Maxwell Perkins, day before yesterday, killed the biggest bull elk I've ever seen. Lots of meat in camp now, wish you were here to hunt. And, and this may be my favorite letter as an artifact. Um, this is actually written on both sides of a ripped off piece of a brown paper bag. You can kind of see the, the rough serrated edges there. Uh, in the paragraph immediately following his description of the bull elk, he wrote, uh, they brought the mail last week, rode 45 miles to camp with it, comes again tomorrow. I went out without pencils or paper like a damn fool and have only a stub of pencil in this paper sack. So I like to imagine Max Perkins, who always wore a fedora hat, 
dignified gentleman sitting there in his uh, Fifth Avenue office in New York City opening this letter with a, a paper bag. Um, well, there are so many more faces of Hemingway that his letters this period reveal. I just can't even begin to touch on them here. Uh, the shrewd businessman, the astute political observer, loving husband, proud papa, dutiful son, loyal friend, generous neighbor, bullying adversary, Gregorious host, um, but above all, always a dedicated and disciplined writer. Um, Hemingway always viewed letter writing as a distraction from his real writing. And yet, even if he did not take them seriously, his letters hold enormous interest and value as a chronicle of his life and times in the continuous present tense. And I'm going to end right there and uh, invite you to uh, give me some questions. La ladies and gentlemen, let's give a nice round of applause for Dr. Sandy Spaniel. Wow, that's why I became a mathematician. It's a lot easier. <laughs> Questions? Looking for, oh, I see the hands are starting to go up now as they stretch to the sky. I wondered if you, I'm sure you must have reviewed other great collections of letters, and if so, which of those influenced you perhaps in how you decided to put together this collection? This actually wasn't a project I went seeking. Um, so I didn't study a lot of other collections of letters. I mean, I have since to kind of see how, how this is done. But um, there came a time when uh, the, the Hemingway family had decided that it, Patrick Hemingway in particular wanted there to be a complete scholarly treatment of his father's letters. It's, it's a long, complicated story, but the copyrights of the letters are split between something called the Ernest Hemingway Foundation, which was founded by his wife, Mary, and the Hemingway Foreign Rights Trust, which is the family. And both of those entities had decided um, around the turn of this new century that they wanted to embark on this project. And I was very honored to be approached and asked if I would like to take it on. Um, it didn't come with any letters, it didn't come with any salary, it didn't come with any support. Uh, it just came with the title and the responsibility um, and the chance to do something really, really um, exciting and meaningful. So um, I, had, I did talk to other people who were in charge of, of big, long-term editorial projects and to just get a sense of what do I need in order to do this successfully. And, and they said, you've got to have release time from teaching. You've got to have some graduate assistance. Um, you need computer support. So I went to my dean, and she was very excited at the prospect. So um, this project has received institutional support from Penn State, but also a number of grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and um, some individual philanthropic gifts, too. But um, it, And then we didn't have a publisher either, of course. So. Uh, that was another couple of years of sending out a prospectus to various publishers. There aren't that many publishers who want to take on sort of an open-ended, unlimited, multi-year print edition because at the time, the family would only allow print. Now, as of 2020, these books are now being available electronically. So there was a lot of setup time. And then just finding the letters, that, that took literally years to scout out the letters. Where are they? We're still finding letters. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's, it's, does that answer your question? <laughs> it's not directly an answer, but. From the, from the chat, uh, from the Zoom, remember we have a number of people on Zoom. Okay. Shia Noack writes, how does the, li how does his life relate to the hills like white elephants? Oh, well, that is a, Hills Like White Elephants is a very characteristic Hemingway story. And um, one of the, he's very famous for his style. He, he won the uh, 1954 Nobel Prize for his mastery of style and his influence on uh, English prose. And one of the hallmarks of the Hemingway style is his so-called iceberg theory. 
And that was, he felt, that the beauty of an iceberg was the fact that 78, 7 eighths of it was below the surface. And if you look at some of the writing that Hemingway did for newspapers, uh, he would write these long, colorful descriptions of, of there was a, a scene of refugees in the Greco-Turkish War, and he talks about how the cavalry men herded them along like cowpunchers herding cattle, and it was full of adjectives and all kinds of colorful descriptions, and it was very well done for a 23-year-old, or anybody else for that matter. When he went to make art um, in Paris and decided to move away from journalism, he, he sort of went the route of like, a, a painter who knows how to do representative painting to an abstract painter. He said he wanted to do in words what Cezanne did in paint. So to just cut things away, to leave blank spaces, and to trust that the reader would feel things, even if they weren't spelled out. Now, the story Hills Like White Elephants is a perfect example of that, because that's a story in which a man and a woman are having a very tense discussion while they're waiting for a train. And the, it's all about the man's trying to talk the woman into having an abortion. But the word abortion is never mentioned. And it takes a lot of really attuned reading to figure out what they're even talking about. But that's what makes the story so powerful. And it's a very good example of, um, of that style that won Hemingway all of this acclaim. Next question comes from Debbie Heller, uh, I'm sorry, Debbie Heller, and she asks, despite Heming's, Hemingway's disavowal of his letter writing style, do you agree with this assessment? Uh, no, actually, I think his letters are wonderful. Um, one of the things, I, I cut this a bit short, but the, one of the things, I'll, I'll just read to you what he said about writing. Um, himself, and then you can see if this fits. Uh, he, he published this piece in Esquire in 1934 called Old Newsman Writes a Letter from Cuba. And he said in this, all good books are alike in that they are truer than if they had really happened. And after you have finished reading one, you will feel that all that happened to you. And afterwards, it all belongs to you the good and the bad, the ecstasy, the remorse and sorrow, the people and the places and how the weather was. If you can get that so that you can get that to people, then you are a writer. And what I'd say is that Hemingway didn't keep a journal, but his letters are this vivid, spontaneous account, a real-time record of his life and times. They capture experience and the freshness of the moment, the people, the places, and how the weather was. And so if that's his definition of what a good writer does, I would say that's what he's doing in his letters. And they, they are very fresh. They can, he can be furiously angry. He, interestingly, he will sometimes vent in a letter and then put that letter aside and never send it. But the other thing is, he never threw it away either. Um, he can be very tender, he can be very affectionate. Um, I think it just, it rounds him out personally so much, but at the same time, it's a picture of, our, of the 20th century because he's a journalist, he's a keenly observant, he is in major places of 20th century history, World War I, Paris in the 20s, um, Spanish Civil War in the 30s, World War II. Um, he really had his uh, finger on the pulse of his times and, um, so I think his, his letters are, they're fun to read, actually. Very fun to read. Other questions? Yes. I have, wait, you need the microphone first. I know you have a very good, yes, you do, because it's being recorded. I'm sorry. Yes. Beautiful job, Sandra. Oh, Love it. You. As a member of the Hemingway Society, thank you very much for being here. My question is about the relationship that Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald had with the Hemingways. Can you comment on that? Well, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so Scott, Scott Fitzgerald is the older and more successful writer. 
Um, he, he had published several books before Hemingway meet, met him in Paris in 1925, um, including The Great Gatsby. And so it was Fitzgerald who really took Hemingway under his wing and went to his editor at Scribner's, Max Perkins, and said, this guy's the real deal. Max, you gotta, gotta get this guy, Ernest Hemingway. So Hemingway owes a huge amount to Fitzgerald. Um, Fitzgerald even critiqued um, the, uh, the manuscript of The Sun Also Rises. Hemingway followed his advice and to the better. Um, Fitzgerald was married to Zelda Sayer, uh, and Zelda was a brilliant woman. She wrote a book herself in 1932 called Save Me the Waltz, which is sort of this modernist masterpiece, except it she, she did have mental health problems, and they both had, they both drank way too much, and drink did not sit well with either of them. It made them do really foolish things, and uh, Hemingway just got kind of disgusted at some point by the fact that he thought Fitzgerald was so talented and just wasting his talent selling things to commercial magazines, and then Hemingway blamed Zelda for being jealous of Scott's talent and trying to destroy him. So Ernest Hemingway and Zelda had this very wary relationship of, of each other. And um, it, 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 the, the relationship, it, it's kind of sad because the tables turned and then Hemingway was the big success and Fitzgerald then was sort of the washed up has been for a long time. Um, but nevertheless, you have these, the back and forth and their letters that is, affectionate and respectful to the end. I mean, Fitzgerald died in 1940 at a very young age, and, and he was a has-been. He was, at the time, um, it would be nice for him to know that the great Gatsby has endured and is still read all over the place. But, um, yeah, so it was a contentious relationship. Uh, other questions? We have another one over here. Deb Heller writes, is it true that William Carlos Williams broke his hand on Hemingway, Hemingway's jaw in Key West? I think it might, you know, I think it was, he got into some scuffle with Wallace Stevens, another poet. I'm not sure it was William Carlos Williams, but... Um, there was some kind of scuffle, and the details of it are a little murky. So I, I don't really want to <laughs> give a definitive answer on that. But Well, as you know, what happens in Key West stays in Key West. <laughs> right. right. I have one more question. I don't know how much you can say about it, but um, in the letters, what have been your impressions of the relationships with women? And perhaps um, if you can comment at all on like his mental illness and how that affected the women in his family, including his daughter and granddaughters. Um, I have a lot of curiosity about that. Well, that's a, a lot of questions <laughs> in, in one. Um, the relation, he has a, a bad reputation uh, about relationships with women. And I, I, I mean, some of it is certainly deserved uh, and some of it I think is not. Um, he had in his early letters, which if you read the letters of volume one, it's really surprising the, the conversations he has with his mother. Um, they, both, they shared a taste for opera. They made jokes with each other. He went on to say later that he hated his mother. And they, it was after their father's suicide, his father's committed suicide in, in 1928. And, the relationship with his mother really did go seriously downhill after that. Um, he went so far as to accuse his mother of driving the father to suicide. Um, so that got very, very ugly. But um, in his youth, he had a great relationship with his sisters. He was the only boy in the family until he was 15 years old and his little brother Lester was born. Um, Patrick, uh, his son, said, what is it that they say he doesn't understand women. He grew up in a house of women. He had all these sisters. He had friends who were girls. Um, I've met people who, who knew him in his later years. Uh, Valerie Danvey Smith 
was a 19-year-old Irish uh, reporter when she met him in 1959, and he swooped her up in his entourage in Spain. Um, she, she went on at his funeral to meet his son and later married the son, so her name's Valerie Hemingway. Anyway, she is in her 80s now and speaks very fondly. She said that he was so much fun and that that completely misses, uh, is left out of, of a lot of, of depictions of him. So I would say that the relationships are a lot more complicated. He could be awful, there's no question about that. Um, but some of the letters in particular I love are the ones he wrote to Martha Gellhorn while um, they were married. They, had, they also had a kind of a bitter breakup because she left him. She dumped him, and that was really painful. Um, but the letters that he wrote to her in, while their relationship was, was really thriving are wonderful because he's, he's basically totally supportive of what she's doing. Um, he's running errands for her. He's you know, just doing all this, this uh, legwork for her so that she can get her writing done. And he writes about how proud she, he is of her and how uh, the, the work she does makes him just feel like a carpenter nailing, you know, putting nails in wood when she's this masterful craftsman. So there is so much in the letters that give so much depth and nuance and richness and so many more dimensions to what we think we know about him. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending an evening here at Western New Mexico University, and thank you so much to the world's eminent scholar on all things Hemingway, Dr. Sandra, all of a sudden I forgot here, Dr. Sandra Spanier. Thank you so much, Dr. Spanier, for being here. Thank you. And of course, uh, there are some of, of the, the books up front of the letters, particularly the first, I believe the first four volumes or five volumes are up there? I think we have volume one, the first, and volume five, the most recent. So please help yourself to a copy of that. She'll be happy to stick around and sign uh, the book. And if you have any questions or follow-up conversations, she'll stick around until tomorrow morning at breakfast. No, not that long. Thank you very much.